Good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Kevin Walls and I am the Client Relationship Manager for Scottish Edge. Thank you all for joining us for this webinar, which will support SMEs to navigate what seems to be the ever-changing world of importing and exporting goods. Scottish Edge has partnered with the Institute of Export and International Trade to share insight, which will help our clients and the wider SME network avoid common pitfalls which can, which can damage the growth of your business. For those on this session who are not clients of Scottish Edge, we are a Scottish-based business funding competition and we award up to £3 million per year to Scotland's best innovative and high growth potential startups. We also provide a wraparound business support network backed by key sponsors from Scottish Enterprise, Scottish Government, the Hunter Foundation and Royal Bank of Scotland. As you will have read in your joining instructions, you will be given lots of great information on exporting to maximise opportunities for your business. We hope you find this session both beneficial and take action on your new learnings from today to get ahead of your competition. I would now like to hand you over to Will Barnes Graham of the Institute of Export and International Trade. Over to you, Will. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you for uh, such a kind introduction as well. It's a genuine pleasure to be speaking to you all today. Uh, as said, I'm William Barnes Graham, the Executive Editor at the Institute, and I will be asking some of your questions to the brilliant Susan Rowe, who is a Customs and Trade Specialist at the Institute as well. Hi, Susan. How are you today? And out of interest, where are you joining us from? Good morning, Will. Good morning, Kevin. Lovely to be with, here with you all today. And good morning, Scotland. I hope you enjoyed your boon supper last night. Um, so I am on the southern edge of the Cotswolds in England. Um, it's cold today. Uh, and yeah, that, that's me looking forward to talking you through some of the interesting complexities of import and export. Thank you, Susan. It, it really is a beautiful part of the country and very good spot on, on Burns Night. I'll be uh, going to a, 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 a do on Saturday, I believe. So great stuff. As you can see, uh, Susan, uh, on the next slide, uh, you'll see on this slide that Susan is a vastly experienced person in international trade with particular expertise around e-commerce, website internationalization and growing markets through distributors and trade shows. And the less said about me, probably the better. Uh, these slides we can share with you afterwards, by the way, so you can read more about us then. But on the next slide, for those of you who don't already know, the Institute was established over 85 years ago to support UK businesses in growing their international markets and trade. The Institute is the U leading UK association of exporters and importers providing education and training to help professionalise businesses that do international trade, some of which we will mention throughout today's webinar. Our membership offering includes discounts on this training, as well as access to a technical helpline, a daily update bulletin updating you on all the key developments in trade, member exclusive webinars, online and real life networking opportunities, and so much more. We have offices in England and Northern Ireland and will soon be opening up in Scotland as well as Wales, but already view ourselves as a truly UK-wide organisation. Now, on the next slide, I uh, would just like to, first of all, thank you all for submitting your questions when registering, and also in the survey Scott Edge ran at the end of last year. We reviewed all of these and we'll be structuring today's presentations around these core fee key, key themes that emerged in your questions. So these are how to reach custom customers internationally, how the UK border now operates since the UK left the EU. The customs procedures and documentation that you now need to complete for continued trade with the EU. And some of the easements and authorizations available to help you manage these new processes. Before we get into your questions about international trade, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. This webinar is being recorded today and Scott Edge will be sharing a link to the recording shortly after it finishes. You can ask questions during the session using the GoToWebinar control panel, and we will try to cover as many of these as we can. However, we will not go into company specifics as such, but we'll look to cover questions that are relevant to the wider audience. But now, don't worry, uh, enough of me, we're going to get into your questions. So Susan, we had a lot of questions come in reflecting the difficult current economic climate. 
we know the UK in, in some quarters anyway, has been forecasted to enter an economic recession this year with the COVID pandemic, energy and cost of living crises, war in Ukraine and post-Brexit adaptations all having an impact. So since the start of the pandemic in 2020, just how much has the trading environment changed for businesses and what are the most tangible changes and challenges for traders? Wow, what a great question to start with. Um, thanks, Will. So yeah, as indeed you've just pointed out, there have been some unprecedented changes and indeed challenges over the last couple of years. And, and all of those have added to dare I say, the already complex international trade landscape, which, as we know, has multiple actors, complex documentation and different government systems, which data needs to be inputted through. So some of those challenges that we've particularly been experiencing over the past few years, few years because of the reasons you've mentioned, are, first of all, disruption to international supply chains from the pandemic and the war in Ukraine as well. So when we think that the supply chain starts at the beginning and goes to an end process of getting materials and products to the final destination. So what we've actually seen is disruptions all the way along that uh, supply chain in the form of delays, shortages, additional costs, the shutting down of ports and factories, now, interestingly, all at the same time that all that's been happening, the increase in con consumer demand has significantly increased. Um, so the second change that we've seen over the last couple of years, of course, is our exit from the European Union. And it's really interesting because even though the European Union is a union within its own geography, to us now in the UK, it's actually 27 different member states. And whilst there may be some trading similarities between some of those member states, there are actually some significant differences as well. So we're having to bear that uh, as well. And because the UK has now left the single market and customs union, there isn't a free flow of goods anymore. So we've now got to complete paperwork and we've got to declare our goods that moving through that customs border. So those are two significant challenges that we've been facing. But on a more positive note, and for those on the webinar today who asked in advance about how to reach customers in different countries, what we have seen, again due to the pandemic, is a significant increase in online sales and businesses pivoting to online uh, business channels or digital channels to market, sell and promote their goods and services. So retail saw a massive uplift in online sales, including from customers who didn't previously buy online. Um, and much of that has actually been retained as well. Um, and we've also, as I said, seen businesses pivot to a more, a more digitally enabled model of selling and marketing through digital channels. And that's just as well, because what we've also seen in that space is that the web consumer now has become so savvy. They want to find quality information and quickly. Thank you, Susan. Some really important points there. I mean, the, the flow of goods as not being as easy as it was is well known, of course, but the fact that all those 27 member states are slightly different, really important. And uh, Glad there's a, a nice positive note as well there about the, the changing consumer patterns and the, the rise, the increased rise of online. I mean, as you say, there's plenty of challenges, but it, it is true that as as well as, you know, in, there are always being opportunities in challenging times and there has been these trends, as you've noted. How can businesses make the most of these opportunities, including the online pivot during the pandemic? That, that, that's a, a great question as well. And so important now as well, because as I mentioned, consumers that I'm calling, um, talking about web consumers here, um, they want this online experience that's going to be frictionless, relevant, connected. And in other words, they're only concerned with getting what they want when they want it. So even though businesses have pivoted towards digital channels for helping to sell and market their, their values, um, 
that there, there is still a lot that could be done to maximize that reach to global customers or prospects through um, through some of these digital channels. And I've got a slide here that, that um, I'm just let me talk through some of those digital channels, some of the more key ones that businesses use. Obviously, this isn't exhaustive, um, but these are some of the key ones that are used. So first of all, most companies, most businesses on the call today as well will have a company website, okay? So our websites have the potential to reach 4.6 billion internet users across the world. And if it's structured, optimized and localized for international markets imagine the traction that it could get out of those 4.6 or so billion i'm going to talk about websites in a bit more detail in just a moment but let's look at social media platforms so again most businesses are using some form of social media to promote their message and or brand um, but it's important to remember that different social media platforms attract different audience types what I often see is businesses doing what I call a spray and pray approach, you know, set up a few social media platforms and hey, sit back and watch what happens. But what we should be considering is where do our customers hang out? Which of those platforms do they actually gravitate to? And we also need to bear in mind that there are different social media platforms that could be used in the countries that you're wanting to export to. So we've also got online directories. Now, online directories are a digital channel, probably more for the service business. And it's a low cost way to drive potential customers to your website. So all it is is putting your, up your business profile, your value, and, uh, and then that, uh, that, that, that can generate traffic to your website. And a lot of businesses don't actually know what online directories they might, um, it, that might benefit them. And then we've got online marketplaces. So I know that there are a few retail businesses on, on the webinar today. So some of you might already be selling on uh, platforms such as Amazon, eBay, and the other 450 so in the world for consumers. But what we've also seen in the last couple of years, which is really interesting, is that business to business online marketplaces are really coming into their own now as well. And we're seeing an emergence of new types of marketplace. So it's where um, brands can go on there and then be put in touch with distributors or buyers in other countries. So they're not actually selling anything. It's almost like an introduction platform and that's becoming really prevalent now. And then finally on this slide, we've got video channels. A lot of businesses don't maximize video channels like YouTube. But what I can tell you is that YouTube users worldwide um, they take up to something like a billion hours combined of video content on the platform daily. It's huge. It's also free to set up. And it was launched in 2005. It was acquired by Google a year later. And it has become the largest video platform in the world. It's got huge advertising opportunities as well. And it also has the highest return on investment of any video content platform. And words and films speak a thousand words when um, trying to appeal to a global audience. So let's just have a quick look at our own website then, our company website. As I said, all of us have got one. So now I would say is as good a time as any to revisit your message, who you want to attract through your website, localize and optimize for overseas markets. What do I mean by that? Different languages, different keywords that people might be searching in other languages to get to your website, okay? So the European market alone is so multicultural and linguistically diverse. So if we want to reach customers or prospects in those countries or indeed further afield, we need to speak their language and not just in terms of the linguistic aspect, but also 
what they're looking for as well. And incidentally, for anyone who may be exporting or wanting to export to the United States, there are 4,000 differences in terminology between American and British English. So again, we need to get our search right if we want to attract uh, customers from that part of the world as well. So I would also be looking at why should your prospects or customers buy from you? You need to clearly communicate what problem that you can solve, your product solves, your service solves, and what is your value. So that's the benefits, not the features of what you offer, but the benefits. And then what do you want your website visitors to do as well? What call to action do you want them to do? Download something or call you, for example? And how easy is your website to navigate through? When's the last time that you actually journeyed through your website to see what your customers or website users are seeing as well? And then I've put how on this slide because once someone has visited your website, what do you want them to do next? What is that buying journey, the next stage of that journey. And that's where a lot of businesses can fall down because people can jump off the website because there's no clear call to action about what to do next. And again, localizing and optimizing. Remember, our users now globally are looking for a frictionless and quality experience. And particularly those of us who are using our websites to sell online, we need to be able, they need to be able to pay in their own um, currency, if you like, or uh, they need to be able to look at the product in their own language, etc. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. Hopefully, I've given a few tips in that in that space for for our webinar visitors today. Thank you, Susan. Plenty of really good tips there. It's such a, an important area, and I learned a couple of things there. A billion uh, hours a day on YouTube and 450. Uh, online marketplaces, really uh, striking stats too. Um, what are the most common pitfalls though that traders experience when trying to reach customers online? Because it is such a vast, vast world. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, another great question there. I, I, I think my immediate response to that will would be, it's not a case of build it and they will come. OK, it needs to be localized and optimized and, it, you know, in accordance with with your target audience as well. Um, so who are those target audiences? What what are their personas? Um, think about fishing with spears and not with nets. Uh, that analogy that I often give and think about personalizing the message as well. We want as consumers now, web consumers, we want we want to feel special. We want to we want you to reach us uh, in a personal way where and that is possible to do. Again, speaking your customer's language and optimize that reach and appeal for international traffic. This is not expensive to do. In fact, most of it's free to do. It might take a bit of time, but it's certainly not uh, um, you know, costly. And one last point, and this particularly talks to those who are selling into the United States. It has 50 states. Treat those 50 states like 50 different countries because really they are with different rules. Um, so I hope that answers that for you. It sure does, thank you. Uh, and I always like a fishing analogy as well, so that's uh, all the colourful stuff. Uh, thank you everyone for sending in your questions as we go. We've got a question here from Philip, who asks, to what extent are traditional routes to market like trade shows now coming back to the fore in the post-pandemic new normal? Wow. Yeah, great question, Philip. Um, they are definitely coming back. They are definitely coming back. They were the biggest hit industry when the pandemic struck. They were the first to shut down. Um, so a lot, a lot was lost, uh, over, uh, you know, because of that. So it's no surprise then that as soon as they could come back, the industry did start to get back on its feet. And even though there may be smaller numbers that are attending, Arguably, it's those smaller numbers that have actually ventured out because they're serious attenders now and they, they're serious about doing business. So um, 
interestingly, again, in the digital uh, space, what we have seen from physical trade shows coming back is that there has been a, an uplift in digital touch points. So, for example, we're seeing more interactive digital displays on the stand. We're seeing a rise in augmented and virtual reality on the stand as well. Because again, businesses are wanting to give their customers that awesome experience, both on the booth and through online uh, digital channels as well. Um, so yeah, they, they're coming back, well, they are back. Okay, so I went to a trade show recently and it's like going to a Tomorrow's World episode or something like that. So <laughs> it's definitely, that's definitely rings true to me. Um, but let's, let's move on to the second group of questions now, uh, which are largely around the UK's border and how it's being developed to operate now that we've left the EU. Um, I mean, Susan, could you just give a, a quick recap on what measures have been introduced so far? I, I certainly can. Um, yeah, OK, so when we came out of the European Union, obviously this gave us a, a, a massive positive opportunity to, um, to build a more, a, a more effective border and measures have been put in place as part of that and those measures form part of something called the border operating model if, if that's come onto anyone's radar at all and this has been in place since the transition period of our exit from the European Union. Now really interestingly we've just been talking about digital channels for reaching and selling uh, to customers overseas but actually our goods have to pass through physical borders. So this is where it can, can become a bit more complex. So as part of this border operating model, it's provided traders with a framework of processes and requirements for sending goods out of and bringing goods into the UK. So with bringing goods in, and this is where I'm going to focus on imports for a little bit now, because we have introduced, well, the UK government's introduced importing in stages okay uh, as part of this border operating model and further measures are expected to come in towards the end of this year as the UK government continues its work on the border strategy and that what's that going to look like it's going to include more digital customs processes and interfaces we'll talk about that in just a moment but let's first of all look at the some of the measures measures that have come in place now or since the transition that form part of that um, border operating model. So firstly, we've now got two primary port models. We've got the pre-lodgement and temporary storage models. OK, so with the pre-lodgement model, this requires that the export and import paperwork is in place before the vehicle checks are in at the port of departure. So everything's been done in advance. With the temporary storage model, on the other hand, this is where containers can be shipped and even landed up to 90 days before they need to be customs cleared. So obviously it will depend on the route, which port uh, that your goods either uh, come in, uh, into or even leave from. Um, what we've also seen as part of these measures is that now the UK is out of the EU safety and security zone, safety and security declarations need to be made for goods being sent to mainland uh, Europe, but not the island of Ireland. So safety and security um, declarations are a way of analysing the potential risk of goods that are being imported into the UK or uh, exported out of. Um, and these declarations have to be completed prior to arriving at the port of uh, departure. Uh, so submitting these documents will then generate what's called a goods movement reference number um, that we need to get those goods cleared or, or you know, to leave. OK. So. Um, then we have the introduction of the GVMS or Goods Vehicle Movement Service. So this is an IT system that's been put in place to speed up vehicle throw, flow through the border. And what it does is pre-alerts customs to what's coming in, what's going out of the country. So that allows the vehicles then to, to move quicker 
through the border. So that's another measure that's been put in place. And you'll see that not all these are negative. Some of them are actually really good. Um, so on the accounting side, we've seen simplification of the duty deferment account. So this was put in place with a guarantee waiver on the duty and the ability to postpone VAT declarations as well to only make them on the tax return and not pay VAT at the point of import, which would typically happen. You know, we're paying VAT on imports um, now. So the other requirement is uh, for any customs agent or broker, and some of um, some of our attendees today who are already exporting could be using a third party such as an agent or a broker, and they'll be raising declarations on the trader's behalf. But what has to happen now is that the intermediary has to have received a completed uh, representation form that gives them the authorization to act on the trader's behalf and make those declarations using their own duty deferment account and postpone the VAT uh, as required. So what we've also seen are measures for the movement of sanitary and phytosanitary goods. So that includes animals, products of animal origin, plants and plant-based products as well. So these SPS measures that they're called were put in place to control imports for live animals and products of animal origin. But the other new measures for uh, export health certificates and checks at border control posts, these are part of the ones that are coming into play at, at the end of the year. And what does the end of the year look like? Well, what the UK government is doing, as I alluded to earlier, is working towards this Global Britain 2025 border strategy, which looks something like this. So basically, this strategy is part of the vision for the UK border in order to be the most effective in the world. So a border that embraces innovation, that simplifies processes for traders and indeed travellers as well, and improves the security and biosecurity of the UK. So one of the reasons that the last of the measures uh, ha that they haven't yet been implemented is because of this Global Britain 2025 strategy that the, the government is, is currently uh, working on. And as part of that, a more developed operating model called the target operating model is going to be published and that's going to be published at some some point early this year and that will again outline the plan processes and requirements for the UK border so that would almost replace the current border operating model it will then morph into the target operating model so once it has been published they'll then follow a, a period of engagement with industry before fully impressed implementing these import uh, controls at the end of this year. And the target operating model is envisaged to deviate from the controls regime that the EU applies to their own imports. And it's intended to focus on decreased border checks, yet increased efficiency. You will. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I mean, Border operating model, target operating model, lots of models. It feels like we're in Milan or something. But um, the government has described the, the new the new target of operating model, its, its new approach, as relying more on digitalized or risk-based checks. W what does that mean? Yeah, that, well, so this is where um, you mentioned the border operator model and the target operating model. So think of the latter as being um, the one that is going to encompass these more digitalized and risk-based um, elements, okay? So those planned implementations of border controls, we are going to be based on a better assessment of risk and they're also going to harness the power of data and technology. So it, it's almost going to take over the border operating model and encompass all these different um, areas of data, technology 
uh, and assessment of risk as well. And the government's currently working on a number of systems. So some of you may have heard of the single trade window and the digitalization of processes are examples of that. But we've also got the ecosystem of trust that's going to come into play as well, which, and this is going to be a trusted trader scheme, again, based on HMRC's risk assessment of traders uh, on areas such as their such as their customs and and tax compliance as well. And you mentioned uh, there were some controls that have not yet been introduced that are going to be covered by the T uh, by the target operating model. Can you just recap what what those are? <clears throat> so they are mainly to do with the sanitary and phytosanitary products I mentioned earlier, so animal uh, type and plant uh, products. So the SPS controls that were introduced in January 2021 were for the highest risk of imports of animals, animal products, plants and plant products. So they'll continue to apply, but the ones still to be introduced are um, there's a requirement for sanitary and phytosanitary checks currently at the destination that's they're going to be moved to what's called a border control post as currently happens in the EU. There's also going to be a requirement for safety and security declarations on in EU imports which doesn't currently happen okay that's an easement in place at the moment so there's also going to be a requirement for a health certification for further sanitary and phytosanitary imports and a requirement for sanitary and phytosanitary uh, goods to be again presented at these uh, border control uh, points as well and there are also going to be prohibitions and restrictions on the import of chilled meats from the EU as well so those are those are the main ones that are still to be introduced and will be introduced as part of this target operating model. Thanks, thanks Susan. Uh, we'll do a few quick questions which have been coming in, one from Annetta who asks whether exporters need to start moving to the new customs declaration <coughs> service now or later in the year. I think there's a deadline coming so could you say a little bit more about the CDS migration please? Yeah I will do so. Um, just to give it this a, a little bit of context, if I may, currently there are two HMRC systems that are being used for um, declaration. So the first is the chief one. And as you quite rightly said, that it has retired for imports. It retired on uh, the 30th of September last year and it's going to fully retire. So it's going to retire for exports as well in November this year. So once November comes, that's the end of chief after 30 years of hard work and in comes the customs declaration service or CDS system which is currently be, being used for imports and Northern Ireland entries as well and in November it will be used for exports as well. Um, now for those of you who may be using uh, external intermediaries for declaring your your um, your customs declarations, then these systems you may have heard of them, but they're not fully on on your radar. But basically, that's that's what they do, um, and the systems are quite different to each other. So the CDS system, the later one, that encompasses again a lot of these digital or data elements. Um, that, that we're seeing as part of the UK's global border strategy. Really interesting. It seems really important that traders get this right. And Kevin alluded to earlier how we're going to talk about some of the common pitfalls of some of these things you're talking about. So what are the common pitfalls traders have faced with the move to CBS? Um, it, it's mostly to do with the difference, I would say, between Chief uh, and, and CDS. So. Um, in chief, there, there was more there was more room to add more information. In CDS, there's there are more data elements to be completed, but there's less room for information. So it's really, really important that the information is absolutely accurate according to the data elements as well. So I would say that those are some of the biggest uh, common uh, pitfalls. Um, what we're also seeing interestingly is that some traders who have typically outsourced their customs declaration activity, they're now wanting to bring it in-house um, and that's 
no mean feat, really. I mean, that, that, that I would say that a trader needs to be guided through that process and there's certain software, government software that, that needs to be used. And there are also cost implications that need to be borne in mind uh, as well. So perhaps that's another uh, common pitfall. It's not as easy as it, as it might look on the surface. I should flag that the Institute is going to, is going to be doing several webinars and uh, training courses and, and whatnot on just this uh, issue. So do keep an eye out on our website for more information about that. Finally, for this part of the session, we had a really good question in from Pfizer, who asks what impact the UK's new free ports will have, particularly the green free ports in Scotland, which I believe were announced recently. So yeah, could you say a little bit about free ports in general, please? Yeah, and I'll start by saying congratulations, Scotland, because they have, yes, indeed been introduced. So free ports are uh, special areas within the UK's borders um, where different economic regulations apply. So there are, I think it's eight uh, approved free ports in England. And now, of course, we've got the two green free ports in Scotland, one in Inverness and Cromery Firth and one in the Firth of Forth. So Basically, free ports offer a comprehensive package of measures comprising of tax relief, customs, business rates retention, planning, regeneration, innovation, and trade and investment support as well. And this is supported by the Department of Leveling Up and brings benefits to some of our dis most disadvantaged uh, communities. So businesses who are operating within Freeport custom sites, they can benefit from warehousing and processing customs authorization. And there's no time restriction for the storage or processing of goods. And a customs guarantee isn't required to cover the duty uh, and tax of the goods as well if they're stored in a, in a free port. So if you process goods in a free port, you might also be able to benefit from duty inversion where you can calculate the import duties based on either the value of inputs or finished goods. And they can then move between free ports and free zones without applying the transit, what's called the transit procedure. And the goods can also be declared to customs using an entry in declarance records without following up a supplementary de uh, declaration, which is what would be needed. So lots of benefits there for free ports. Very exciting stuff. I mean, uh, we're going to move on to the next kind of batch of questions now. And you know, I guess we've heard a lot about the, the rules, the, the new models uh, for trade now we've left the EU. But this section is really looking at what the main practical impact is for businesses. So in a sense, if I'm a Scottish trader selling goods to the French, apart from needing you know, a lot of confidence in my own product and, and some of the strategy things you mentioned earlier, what do I need to do now that I didn't have to do before the UK left the EU? Uh, wow. Well, yes. Yeah, so uh, I think the first thing to say is all goods that are now moving from the UK and so Scotland uh, included, obviously. Um, so they have to now have a customs declaration. They have to move across a customs border. So the correct documents, the correct declarations and the correct data all needs to be gathered um, because selling to the EU now obviously is like selling to any other country in the world. So there are customs procedures to follow as well as having the right documents, uh, declarations and data uh, as I said. So let's just delve into that in a little bit more detail and break it down a little bit. So starting with uh, documentation, so I've just put uh, uh, on the slide there, a various standard set of documents um, for exporting. OK, so there they are um, split between a standard set of documents, which every good will have, and then uh, other documents that might be required depending on the good that's being uh, exported. So documents are such an important aspect of international trade because they provide the information that's required by the customs authorities and they contain really important information that's necessary not only for the buyer and the seller but again also for the customs um, 
uh, the authorities as well. So the first document that we've got here on our slide is the commercial invoice. So this will be issued by the seller as legal evidence of the sales transaction between the seller and the buyer. And it can be used as a customs document for customs purposes. So the information contained within it has to be really accurate, 100% accurate, because its contents will be used to then create the customs declarations. And then we've got the packing list, which is used to give customs a clear information on the identification of the consignment and um, its contents. And what the packing list also does is it keeps a track of the weights and measurements in order to avoid the overloading of whatever vehicle or form of transport it's going on as well. And then we've got a certificate of origin. So this might be required by a particular country. So for example, countries in the Middle East might require an Arab certificate of origin um, that has to be issued by the local consulate to, and that provides official uh, evidence of origin. Um, at, at the port, at the point of import. Let's not forget, well, whatever we export from Scotland or the UK has to be imported somewhere as well. We also need a transport document so that if, whether the goods are travelling by air, sea, road, rail, we need a transport uh, document to, to support that. And then um, we need the customs declaration and there are uh, different types of customs declaration, which we'll see on the next slide. And then again, these additional or other documents that may be required would include uh, some of those that you can see on the right hand side uh, of the slide there. And look at, I just want to revert your eyes to the export health certificate, because even though we have um, easements in place for importing sanitary and phytosanitary goods at the moment, then not an easement the, for sending goods to the, it will require that certification um, in order to get those goods across that customs border. So moving on then to the uh, declaration types, we've got different types of declarations here. So the safety and security declarations. So these are used by border authorities to analyze the potential risk caused to their territory by goods that are crossing the border there. So um, there are basically two types of safety and security. There's an entry one and an exit summary declaration as well. So at the moment, the safety declaration is not required for all imports from the EU um, and it's not required for, for goods um, that are coming from Northern Ireland, but they are required for goods going into the EU. That's important to remember. And then we've got the customs declaration. So this is, of course, an official document that lists and gives the details of, uh, of the goods that are being imported or exported into or out of a customs territory. And these customs declarations, they can be issued as either a full declaration or they can be dele delayed through what's called the simplified process. And this is where a simplified entry is made uh, to get the goods moving and then that's followed up by a supplementary declaration the month after. Now we do need authorization from HMRC to use these, um, the, these types of declarations. And then we have a transit document a, uh, declaration. So this is the official document that lists and give details of uh, goods that are being imported or exported out of a customs territory. Um, and then we have the ATA carnet, so this allows you to temporarily export um, trade fair, or you know, we spoke about trade shows earlier on. Uh, and then we have the oral and by conduct um, declaration as well. So the, we don't need a written declaration for this. We'll, we'll just announce this at, at, at the border. It might be something that we're carrying in our baggage or something like that. So. On the other side of the slide here, we've got data requirements. So the one thing that links all the documents and declarations together is, of course, the data. So this information needs to be provided by the exporter so that the necessary declarations can be completed. And therefore, 
all the data provided again needs to be correct um, i won't go through all of these because many of them speak for themselves but i will just say about the economic uh, operator registration and identification number or eori uh, for short so for those of uh, our callers today who are thinking about exporting or importing and haven't actually done it yet, you will need one of these EORI numbers. And basically this is placed on all the export documents and it's also used to communicate with um, government agencies as well. It's like an identification uh, number. We also need a commodity code. So every single product that gets exported out of or imported into has to have a commodity code. It's an eight digit number for export and a 10 digit number for, uh, for importing. And we also need to check that the rules of origin requirements that we hold uh, uh, and we have the evidence to back this up as well and the value and the currency that also needs to be part of the data as well uh, and a breakdown may be needed at customs to confirm the value of the actual commodity and that's separate from the, uh, the freight and the insurance as well. Then in code terms, so uh, in code terms or international commercial terms, this is a framework of globally recognised terms which determines where the obligations and the risk and the cost transfer, uh, for it, it takes place from the seller to the buyer, really, really important. And then the net and gross weight kind of speak for themselves and any authorizations that have been granted by HMRC also need to feature as part of the data on the, the declarations. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I think we're coming on to authorizations. A, a real quick quiz, yeah, it's a lot of info there. Uh, really important couple of slides as well. Um, we'll come on to authorizations in a moment, but we've had a couple of user questions. So a question which has come in from Zurida is actually picking up on Inca terms, which is on that slide. Uh, Zurida asks, uh, what Inca terms should we be using now for trade with the EU? Uh, is X work, so, <clears throat> sorry, is X works now not to be used? Well, that's a really, really interesting one. Um, so, X works is an INCO term that is often used by new exporters because it bears the minimum risk. All the exporter or the seller has to do is get the consignment ready and the buyer basically does everything else, sends in their own transport, clears the export uh, declaration, clears the import declaration. Um, however, X works can, can bear some risk to the seller because all um, goods that are leaving the UK now are exports and in, it, with exports we can zero VAT rate the invoice because it's an overseas sale but if we're not the exporter of record as is the case with the INCO term X works how can we prove to HMRC that those goods actually left the, the, the country that those goods were actually an export okay so that is a risk with X works should it be used I don't think it's for me to say, but there is a um, another INCO term called free carrier or FCA that does allow the seller to be the exporter of record and therefore have that information. And it also allows the seller to load the goods onto the buyer's transport when it comes in, which is something the export doesn't do. So I guess if it were me, I probably would go from XWorks to FCA. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And we've got uh, another question in here from Harvinda, who's asking about free trade agreements and claiming uh, preferential tariffs. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how that process works. And I, I can see rules of origins on the slide. So a bit of a, a, bit of a nod to that part. Yeah, 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 that's great. Thanks for pointing that out. OK, so um, you, you mentioned free trade agreements. I think it's first of all important to say that not all trade agreements are free. OK, so it really does depend on <clears throat> on on the product or commodity, what its origin is and what the rules are in the trade agreements between the parties involved. So that then circles back to my rules of origin on the data. So. The aim of a trade agreement really is to either decrease or remove trade restrictions um, 
in order to expand business opportunities between two countries or one country and a block of countries. Let's say the UK and the EU, for example, because we do have a, an agreement, a trade agreement in place. Um, so the the aims of the trade agreement are, as I say, to you know re reduced tariff costs if our products comply with the rules of origin. Um, and again, mentioning the EU and UK trade and cooperation uh, ag agreement, it, it's also important that if we are going to claim that, you know, that reduction in tariff, which is called a preference, we need some evidence to back that up as well as part of our export uh, um, uh, documentation. Uh, in order for our customer in the EU to import on that on that preference. Okay, so specific wording has to be used depending on what the what it says in the free uh, or in the trade uh, agreement. Now the UK, since we again left the EU, uh, we don't have access to the EU's trade agreements that they've got with the world now. So what we've been doing is forging our own trade agreements, a little bit like the one with the uh, UK uh, and the EU. Um, so that gives a kind of whistle-stop tour about what trade agreements are, what, benef what the benefits are, and the importance of knowing what the rules of origin are within that trade agreement. And they can differ from trade agreement to trade agreement. Harvindra, I hope that answers your, your question. Thank you, Susan. I hope it does, Harvinder. Uh, something has just come up my end, so I'm very glad to have uh, my colleague Philip uh, on hand, who's going to deputise for me for the remaining few minutes. Uh, over to you, Philip. Thank you very much, Will. Um, I failed. Yep. Pleasure to join you very briefly on this webinar. Uh, Susan, I believe we're looking to finish off this uh, webinar with a few questions about the solutions that government could provide as it relates to helping businesses, particularly managing the customs requirements face, they're facing. Uh, one area of focus is particularly around completing declarations and duty liabilities. Do you think you could say a little bit about this and how traders in particular can benefit? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have actually got a, a slide around some of these, what, what we call customs easements. So basically, let, let's get the slide up uh, just at the moment. So basically, there are a number of easements in place where traders, so that's importers and exporters, can benefit from uh, deferred payment of duty in VAT or reduced or even zero uh, rate uh, of tariffs as well and in some cases duty suspension, okay? So some of these, you'll see the pinwheel on the slide here. We, we've already had a quick look about trade agreements or trade details. So let's have a look um, at uh, postponed VAT accounting. So th this is a really good way of um, you know, avoiding cash flow problems because since January 2021, all VAT registered businesses have to pay VAT on imports that are coming into the UK from anywhere in the world, including the EU now, of course. But postponed VAT accounting is a system that's uh, that was introduced at, at, uh, in 2021. And what it does is allows businesses to pay for any outstanding VAT on imported goods during their annual return, rather than at the point that they're imported into the uh, UK. We've all got, also got customs warehousing here um, as well. So if we are importing um, goods that we're going to store and then we're going to perhaps re-export them somewhere, um, then this is another um, easement or procedure that allows the storage and or minimal processing of goods imported um, and this is where the import duty liability is discharged because it's moving um, it. What we can do as well is move the goods between customs warehousing and other customs special procedures as well. OK, so customs, if you're bringing goods in, 
it, this is really good for retail businesses as well that bring copious volumes of goods in they're not going to use them at the moment they're not going on the shelves so they could be stored in in the customs warehouse and it's only when they are withdrawn from the customs warehouse that those duties uh, and VAT uh, are, are um, uh, you know need to be paid we've also got we've talked about free ports already so that's another um, area where costs can be uh, mitigated and then we've got inward and outward processing so what this does uh, particularly inward processing it allows raw materials to be imported and then um, and then they they used during a particular time frame and that then delays the payment of any duties. So with inward processing, for example, this allows goods to, to be processed or repaired without the payment of duty or VAT at import as well. Um, so if you are a, a business that is importing goods to process or repair them, then inward, e inward processing could be an easement or procedure that's worth looking at for you. And then outward processing is, of course, the opposite uh, of inward. You may be sending goods to another country to get repaired uh, or, or processed using raw materials from, from the UK. And then we have the duty deferment account. So this allows holders to delay customs duty, excise duty and import VAT. And it can be paid once a month rather than on individual uh, consignments as well. So these are just a few customs easements. There are more. We don't have time to go into them now. But I think my golden tip, one of my golden tips would be, particularly if you're currently importing uh, and exporting, look at some of these uh, easements because um, quite often businesses don't realise that they, they are there and they could benefit uh, you as well. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, we are running short of time, but I think we can squeeze in one last question from Fiona about that, something that came up a, a couple of times during your presentation. She's asking what traders need to do to comply with the EU's new VAT rules and IOSS. Do you think you could say a little bit about that and what the kind of things that traders need to know in general about uh, VAT for those who trade with the EU? Yeah. So. Um... Uh, uh, okay, so for those who used to sell online before um, we exited the European Union, so either through your own website or online marketplaces, you'll remember that um, the EU had various different distance selling thresholds. So it was generally €35,000 in many of the European uh, member states and £100,000 in, um, in Germany. Now, all that's gone. Uh, that uh, all changed in July 2021 and two new VAT regimes were introduced in order to streamline tax compliance for companies selling goods and, and services as well to EU uh, customers. Um, so those two VAT regimes, there's first of all the one-stop shop or OSS as it's known. So this is an extension of the former mini one-stop shop. Um, so this allows businesses, UK businesses, to register for VAT in one single EU country before we had to register in all countries that where we actually met that threshold or we stored uh, goods in a country. Um, so with OSS, we only have to register in one country and then we're, um, we're okay for the rest of the uh, member states. Now, OSS isn't uh, mandatory, but it could be used if you are holding stock in or wanting to hold stock in an EU member state. So that's OSS or One Stop Shop. Then we've got IOS, which um, uh, speaks to Fiona's question, but I needed to put this into context. So IOS is for low value business to consumer sales, so up to the value of 150 euros. So this is 
ideal for smaller order uh, order values, not necessarily smaller businesses, but smaller uh, values uh, up to 150 uh, euros. Um, so again, what you can register for this IOS in one member state and be that uh, okay for the rest of the member states, uh, 27 member states as well. Um, so it's just one registration, less costs, less red tape, um, uh, and uh, again, you can just register in, in the one country that you're primarily going to be selling to. And this is for goods that are fulfilled from source, so fulfilled from the UK, whereas OS is probably more for goods that are stored in the UK. Hope that answers the question there, Phil. No problem. Thank you, Susan. I'm sure Fiona's question was answered there properly. Uh, I think that's a quite a good place to leave it, actually. We're just about um, on time, so let's start to wrap up now. Okay. So I'd like to thank Susan for tackling all those questions and for Scottish Edge for giving us the opportunity to answer them all today. The support is very much appreciated. So just as a reminder that if you want to watch this back, we'll be sending out a link to you shortly with a recording from this. Um, from this. So please do keep your eyes peeled for that. As noted earlier, do check out export.org.uk for more information about the support that the Institute provides uh, to help you and your future business plans and growth. Um, Susan, do you have anything to add before we say goodbye? I, I would uh, I just thank you to everyone um, who's attended today. I, I am mindful that we've covered an awful lot of ground and the top slice of an awful lot of ground, but it, it just wanted to give you a flavour of what the landscape currently looks like for 2023. You've probably got lots of questions. Um, my couple of golden nuggets to take away would be, you know, if you're already exporting and importing, look at your processes. Can they be streamlined? Can you benefit from any of the customs easements that, that um, I've shown you? Um, and if you're thinking about import, it, importing or exporting, if you're just at the start of your journey, don't be put off. Yes, we've seen some challenges, but they can be navigated and there are opportunities uh, as well. It is international trade is a, a, a changing landscape. Keep yourselves updated, get training where there are knowledge gaps uh, and, and bring in our help if, if you need it at any point uh, along the way. We're, we're here to help you. That's it, Phil. That's a great uh, point to end on. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. We really appreciate your time, particularly to Scottish Edge. But for now, from me and Susan, Goodbye, everyone. Have a good end to the rest of your week. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.